our next presenter is going to be, uh, well, our next presentation is a combination remote slash in-person presentation. Um, uh, we're going to have a, a talk on freshwater mussels in the climate basin, which I'm really excited to hear. So um, it's a little bit outside of the water quality and uh, fishery world a little bit, but um, uh, we have Emily Blevins and Christy Nichols uh, who will be speaking on this, and Emily will be presenting remotely. And so we're going to have her share her screen. I believe Christy is here in the room. Yes. Awesome. Come up when you're ready. Yeah. Great. Are you all able to see the presentation? Looks great. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much for inviting us to speak on freshwater mussels today. Um, I'm Emily Blevins, and I'm from the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation and our freshwater mussel lead. Um, our office is based out of Portland, but um, we've been working uh, collaboratively with the Fish and Wildlife Service in the Klamath Basin since at least 2018, I think. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on freshwater mussels, and then Christy is going to share some exciting news about recent monitoring efforts that we have collaborated on in the basin. Um, so I like to give a little background on mussels because many folks are not familiar with them um, or their unique biology. So um, just as some background, freshwater mussels are these long-lived um, filtering bivalve mollusks that are burrowed into the bottoms of lakes and rivers. Um, they have this unique life cycle where they rely on a host fish to complete their uh, reproductive phase. So they have this temporary parasitic stage that lasts about two weeks um, throughout their sometimes over a hundred year lifespan. Um, so very short period of their life where they will attach to a fish um, and for a particular species of mussel that needs to be a particular species of fish um, to serve as that host. And so uh, mussels and fish have this really unique um, uh, relationship because those fish are basically the way that mussels are able to move throughout a stream network. So as adults, these um, species are pretty much immobile in the sediment. Um, and so just for this very brief period of time, they have the opportunity to colonize new habitats or provide gene exchange from um, downstream populations to upstream populations. Um, and where mussels occur, they can occur in incredibly dense beds. Um, and so they uh, can actually consist, um, comprise a very large portion of stream biomass. Um, they can also be incredibly cryptic, and so they can occur in this high density, um, and we may not actually be aware of their presence. So freshwater mussels are distributed nearly on um, every continent, so not Antarctica, but broadly distributed um, and North America is actually a biodiversity hotspot for freshwater mussels. So of the more than 900 species distributed globally, the um, North American fauna comprises about 30% of that um, with a large concentration in the Southeastern US. Um, we have a, a unique fauna in the Western US, so west of the Continental Divide. Um, and mussels are distributed across um, at least 470 uh, watersheds where they've been documented in um, around 2,000 rivers uh, or lakes that we're aware of, but potentially many others where they have not yet been documented. Um, the uh, freshwater mussels, while being incredibly speciose in North America, are also one of the most imperiled groups of species. Um, uh, in North America alone, uh, more than 10% are considered extinct already, and nearly 100 are federally listed as endangered or threatened. Um, we don't currently have any uh, mussels that are listed in the Western US, um, but the Western Ridge mussel, which is present in the Klamath Basin, is currently being considered for listing. Um, the, uh, the species we have are included on many of the state wildlife action plans of species of greatest conservation need, but um, in general, they have few protections. So um, freshwater mussel distribution, um, tribes have known and used um, mussels for um, you know, time immemorial. Um, and recently there have been additional efforts to try to document the locations of mussels throughout the basin. Um, these include recent um, upper basin and main stem survey, surveys by um, the Xerces Society, our partners with Fish and Wildlife Service, 
Mid Klamath Watershed Council, the Karuk Tribe, um, contractors like RDG, and then others like ODFW and the Nature Conservancy. Um, and there was also a great um, past survey effort by some graduate students in the Karuk Tribe in the main stem uh, river and downstream into the lower basin. Um, uh, throughout the basin, uh, there are numerous places where dense beds have been documented, especially below Iron Gate Dam, which is the population that we'll be talking about um, with our pit tag project. Um, but uh, generally, um, I'm just showing a list of locations in the upper Klamath, um, but also mussels are reported from other places um, in the downstream tributaries. We have a uh, few species of mussels um, that are found in the Western US, um, but they can have very broad distribution. So the Western pearl shell is a species that um, can live over hundred years, as I mentioned, um, and it requires salmonids for reproduction. So um, if, uh, if trout or salmon are not present, neither is Western pearl shell. Um, Western ridge mussel is also a, a relatively long lived species living um, up to 60 or more years that specializes on sculpin for reproduction. And then floaters are also a species group that are distributed um, and can also live in uh, lake habitat, particularly like um, Upper Klamath Lake, and it's a host generalist. Freshwater mussels are incredibly important parts of aquatic ecosystems. Um, they, because they spend the majority of their life uh, filtering constantly, they have incredible capacity to improve water clarity and remove nutrients and um, uh, contaminants from the water. So uh, an individual mussel can filter between six and 20 gallons of water a day, and they're doing this um, nearly continuously throughout the year. Um, these mussels, uh, when they are in really dense beds of, you know, hundreds of thousands, can filter a single drop of water multiple times um, as it's flowing downstream during low flow conditions. Um, and they have the ability to remove things like um, E. coli, flame retardants, personal care products, pharmaceuticals, um, and uh, herbicides from the water. Uh, Pacific lamprey have been shown to grow faster in the presence of uh, uh, freshwater mussel beds, um, and they have the ability to actually increase the um, abundance of other aquatic macroinvertebrates seasonally, so um, can increase fish food. They also, um, they do feed on bacteria and algae, so uh, people have documented lower fish mortality and higher um, survival specifically in, uh, in drying pools, um, so fish do better when in the presence of mussels in these kind of stressed habitats. So they uh, have many benefits for other species, um, and those benefits are, uh, are specifically tied to really the density of mussels um, in those mm -hmm. habitats. So the more mussels you have, the, the greater benefits. I just want to show a brief um, video. I'm hoping that this will work. So um, this is a, a video filmed from a lab in uh, Chris Barnhart at Missouri State University. This just demonstrates the filtering capacity of mussels. Um, and what you'll see is a pipette of red dye being applied near the in-current siphon of a freshwater mussel. Um, and shortly after, you'll see the filtering capacity um, that that red dye will be shooting out of the X current siphon, which is uh, in the far ground. So you should start to see a, um, a big bright red straight line coming out of the mussel. So this is really the ability that mussels have that they're you know, performing this filtration um, you know, daily. And that's just a still image of that. So freshwater mussels do need um, constant water. Um, clean water is best for them, of course. They can filter out those pollutants, but they do best when water quality is good as well. And they do need stable habitat features. Um, that's an important aspect of their biology because uh, juvenile mussels, when they fall off the host fish, are, are quite light um, and easily scoured out of habitat. Um, but they can be impacted heavily by uh, scour and sedimentation in rivers. And mussels are facing numerous um, challenges in our Western environments. Um, so many populations are already declining, particularly of Western ridge mussel. 
um, but they are facing issues with drying river habitats and of course um, fires and the effects of those fires. So before I pass it off to uh, Christy, I just wanted to put in a plug that um, freshwater mussels are often um, not the main focus of our research, conservation, or monitoring efforts, but they are fundamental to rivers and improve habitat for fish. Um, and so it's really important that we um, really expand our work on mussels to ensure that they're included in, in our work. Okay, Christy, I'm going to hand it off to you, and I'm happy to keep um, moving through the slides for you. Um, so uh, I got the opportunity to help Emily with a lot of her kind of foundational work on highlighting um, freshwater mussel health uh, as part of the mission of the Xerce Society. Um, I came to know Emily when I participated in a restoration best management practices workshop pertaining to freshwater mussels when I was doing private lands restoration with the partners program here at Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so that was in 2018 and kind of um, piqued my interest on in the matter. Um, in 2019, uh, the KRRC Commission Xerces and the River Design Group uh, for this, uh, the image here is the 2019 Annual Aquatic Resources Survey Report. And that turned out to be really foundational to the work that we did just this past fall. Um, in August 2020, uh, the Xerces Society put forward a petition to list Western Ridged Mussel uh, under the Endangered Species Act. And these two reports were kind of the reason why I ended up getting to spend my fall the way that I did. Um, and as a result, the work that we did focused on Western Ridged Mussel and not the other two species or clades of mussels. So um, based on Hydro, uh, hydro reports for the sedimentation that we can expect from the dam removal efforts. There's high mortality projected to occur in these mussel populations from Iron Gate to Cottonwood Creek, and that's about an eight mile section of river downstream of Iron Gate Dam. The sedimentation depths were projected to be somewhere between a half foot and 1.7 feet. Um, and so that's all of this is kind of what instigated. Um, our effort at trying to document um, revisiting the, the muscle populations and beds that were highlighted in that 2019 report and uh, working on a translocation plan. So you can go to the next slide. So we had three uh, goals, which was one, to complete a Western Ridge muscle survey of that eight mile reach. Um, the timeline ended up that we did not get to uh, accomplish goal number one. But uh, number two was to translocate up to 10,000 Western Ridge Mussel um, from, that, from that high sedimentation reach below Iron Gate Dam and complete a pit tag study on those translocated, some translocated and some um, Western Ridge Mussel that were left in place. And then three was to uh, monitor, this would be upcoming work, the monitor the remaining... <clears throat> Can't read it. Um, <laughs> the, anyway, uh, to monitor the work of uh, the the muscles that we left in place and the and the muscles that were pit tagged that we moved downstream. So you can uh, go to the next slide. We had so much help. It was kind of an incredible um, working group from all over the region, from all the different agencies. It was uh, on a, a pretty tight timeline because. Uh, we didn't really get the go-ahead from Fish and Wildlife Service regional um, leadership until July this past summer to move forward with uh, surveys and translocation and pit tagging of these um, animals. So it was uh, a very tight turnaround. Uh, this was co-led by California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and they came to the table and just really made um, all of kind of the the paperwork, permitting, and logistics um, made it able for us to do this work. So um, I just wanted to highlight that it was quite the collaboration. Um, and I'll get into a little more of that later. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so our process was to um, revisit four uh, of the most easily accessible source sites in that eight mile section where we expected high mortality. 
Um, so Emily and I did a bunch of surveying on the river, uh, figured out where, you know, kind of the choice uh, sites were that would make the logistics of collecting, tagging, and translocating mussels uh, most easy for the, the labor that I, that I begged and borrowed from all these different agencies. Um, the pit tagging process was guided by Xerxes staff, and by that I mean Emily Blevins. Um, the tags were donated to us by Region 1 U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and these were nine millimeter uh, full duplex tags. And um, so uh, we, we had a whole processing station at all of these four um, uh, source sites, and that data was collected. We have um, our files uh, ready for our monitoring that will occur in 2024, 25, and 26. Um, and as I said, the, the targeted beds were based on that um, foundational 2019 survey data from River Design Group and Xerces. So um, uh, in addition to that, Xerces Society shared with me uh, their previous pit tagging reports that down to um, uh, supplies based on per thousand uh, mussels that you want to tag and um, uh, brand name super glue. Uh, it was it was just uh, a very easy thing to pick up because they had done so much work prior to me joining the effort. Um, can go to the next slide. So um, we were, as I said, unable to resurvey that eight mile reach. We just used the 2019 location and bed data that existed. Indeed, we found um, those beds to still be in place uh, based on that survey data. So that was, you know, um, revisiting those sites and, and monitoring the presence is at least another data point that they remain. Um, we accessed four uh, known sites based on um, being able to access them and collect from the site. Some of the sites are you know, between boat launch places and the logistics would have just been um, kind of a bear to, to move animals uh, by kayak and then to truck and then to, to new locations. So, um, Ultimately, we ended up collecting 6,684 mussels. We um, pit tagged uh, just about 4,000 of them, or uh, a little over 4,000, but we left 2,349 where they were found to see what their fate will be based on that um, sedimentation projection. And then we moved the remaining amount uh, downstream. And, the downstream sites were between two and four miles downstream of um, the end of that heavy sedimentation site, so 10 to 12 miles downstream of Iron Gate Dam. Um, and then I just kind of want to highlight the photo on the right is um, Emily. Oh, yeah, that one. Um, it's it just highlights that um, we've we've talked about the Klamath Basin being a stronghold for Western Ridge mussel. And um, we saw, you know, every age class and growth size of the population here. So it was just indicative of a really healthy population and recruitment um, that we were seeing in the river. So it's a, uh, it made us even more heartened to have been able to do this work there and, and try to aid uh, that this stronghold could persist um, in the range because uh, as I'm part of the species status assessment team that is considering this species under uh, to be protected under the Endangered Species Act and the fringes of the range, as can happen often, um, we're not seeing this sort of um, age class structure. Um, and we are seeing at the fringes of the population uh, to the north and to uh, like Southern California, we're seeing uh, population declines. So as part of that team, it was really heartening to see, to see this work. And so if you click again, Emily, there's just a, another photo of um, this, this tagging process. So here's an underwater photo of pit tag mussels. And then um, we the process of tagging them was to let the, the epoxy cure on the mussel shell. And so this is uh, one of the Sacramento US Fish and Wildlife employees laying out those mussels to let them cure in the river before translocating them downstream. Can go to the next slide. So um, this is my uh, really terrible map that I got off of Google Earth yesterday. Um, and it just kind of highlights that this is the space between Iron Gate and Hornbrook. That's the eight mile section that we, um, we sourced our, our muscles from. And then if you click again, 
Um, this was uh, at, at one of the release sites. So I want to point out Evan is to the far left and we had um, hatchery technicians from uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, local office, local hatchery um, interns and Sacramento folks. And so this is one of the release sites this is actually at the Randolph Collier I-5 rest area. So if you uh, ever drive I-5 and need a, need a break or a nice lunch spot, we have released some mussels there. Um, and these are places that we'll be revisiting in 2024 and uh, through 2026, um, most of which have been pit tagged. And as you saw with those underwater photos, um, visual surveys are an option um, of the pit tagged uh, mussels, depending on how deep they burrow. Um, but we also plan to do um, sweeps of, of with underwater pit tag readers. Those nine millimeter tags have a, a lower read range, but um, being that we're we're actively seeking them out and we can put the reader close to the substrate, we were less worried about having that read distance. We can go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, this was just an incredible gathering of all the different entities that helped us with this work. Um, I really specifically want to shout out the White Rica office, um, Jenny Erickson and um, Nick Soam, who um, pledged uh, and aided our um, our ability to acquire supplies for this effort. Uh, because it was done with such uh, short notice, we didn't have a dedicated funding pot. So, um, and as I mentioned, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, they co-led the effort and that got us around our scientific collection permit needs because we were able to co-lead with them and utilize their existing permit. Um, we had robust uh, assistance from US Fish and Wildlife through uh, Region 8 and Region 1. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife was part of our original um, plans because we were talking about bringing uh, mussels over state lines. We ended up not doing it, but they were really um, helpful throughout those conversations. Um, the Europe and Klamath Tribes, Child Limited, Xerxes, of course, um, the Chicago Botanical Gardens Internship Program. We had some interns that were there for the entire um, effort and were a, a really pivotal part of keeping that going. River Design Group and RES, uh, RES staff um, helped us coordinate you know, when we could be in the river or near the facilities of the dam, dam removal work. And then if you uh, go one more uh, click, this is a picture of me annoying Emily after I hugged her when I got out of the river. This was the last day um, where we translocated our last muscles. And um, I look forward to, <laughs> I'm gonna embarrass Emily really quick um, because uh, she just has been such a phenomenal uh, spokesperson and conservation biologist for freshwater mussels. And as I mentioned, Xerxes being so foundational to the work that I was able to pick up and and do this work and try to you know keep um, first of all inform dam removal in the future. And part of the part of the reason that our work was so uh, on such a short timeline is because there was not information about what to do for the macroinvertebrates below a dam removal effort. Um, and so that's our main goal here is to guide those efforts in the future. But um, I don't know if any of you have spent your weekends reading the conservation, conserving the gems of our waters um, or muscle friendly restoration. These are all available online. Emily is a, an author of most of this, uh, most of these documents. And I look forward to uh, finding our work on a shelf in the Emily Blevins Conservation Library sometime in the future. Um, I've just really enjoyed, this has been a highlight of my career and uh, I've, I've been so, so grateful to be a part of it and what Xerxes uh, started with uh, partnering with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife on this effort. It's a great time for a cave up plug because uh, you know our website is a great place to post reports like that, important things like that. So I'll be talking to Emily about that and other speakers uh, today. If they have any other supplementary materials they want to go along with their PDF of their talk, uh, we'd love to get that from you. So um, questions from the audience? Yes. Name, uh, please. Sorry, James Brown, the USGS, and I was. Uh, I'm interested in post, you know, dam removal of the sea, but thinking from a bigger picture perspective, does a bunch of work out at Clear Lake. There seems to be what I would presume large populations of floaters based on the 
still there and acknowledging that Upper Thames Lake has serious water quality issues, what is the role of muscle pass in that system? And should that be a tool or an avenue to think about helping to change water quality in Upper Thames Lake to use of a natural system in terms of muscle and other antagonized human needs? Sure, this is Emily. I'll, uh, I'll pass it to you in a second, but it is something we've kicked around. I used to talk to Alex Gagne about that, and I have mentioned it to Emily Blevins. Our um, local hatchery, when they, they've been undergoing construction, and part of the consideration for some of the um, uh, layout of some of the, the construction in the buildings that they are uh, planning was to include propagation of freshwater mussels. Uh, that's as far as those conversations have gotten. Um, and so, Emily, if you have ideas on that, but we'd certainly be open to discussing, you know, if we think that it'd be a good uh, thing to do in the future to propagate floaters and release into the lake. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't hear all of the um, comment through the speaker, but um, yeah, freshwater mussels, they, ha they do have um, this really incredible impact on um, nutrient cycling um, in these systems. They store quite a bit in their shells, uh, which is a longer term storage method, and then also within their flesh. So they're, they're important denitrifiers in ecosystems, and they do have really high clearance rates under certain water temperatures, so they can be very effective at removing suspended um, materials. And as I said, they feed on um, algae, phytoplankton, and bacteria. So they can have a, quite a large impact on, um, on water quality in these systems, um, but it is density dependent and they are patchily distributed. So it would be important to know a little bit about um, kind of what habitat is already available in that lake system because um, they can exist in kind of a range of depths and substrates, but kind of understanding the current distribution would be an um, and density would be an important first step, but certainly um, propagation of, uh, of mussels is going to be a really important conservation tool moving forward, um, particularly in places like California, where species like floaters have already declined from large portions of the state. Um, so I'd be happy to talk more about any specifics or ideas for sure. What? Um, I'm just curious on the relocation. Is there an understanding that relocation is generally 100% successful in and of itself? So you don't have to worry about, you know, taking out a fraction of the life span? Yeah, so that was actually part of, you know, I mentioned the short timeline and, and the uncertainty of the taking this action. And translocation is one of the considerations because, um, uh, again, the Xerces Society has uh, an SOP for translocating muscles. And so, you know, I don't know that, you know, every translocation hasn't been successful. And that's part of why these documents exist. Um, so, you know, we have... Uh, you know, good data that says that we followed a, a protocol that, that sees high survival. But um, but again, there is inherent risk in moving, um, you know, a sedentary animal from its known uh, habitat. So, you know, we, we did uh, surveys, placement surveys um, for the re receiving sites before we, uh, before we translated, located those animals and um, used you know, some criteria to, to try and make sure that we were putting them somewhere where they could survive. And one of those was, are there existing Western Ridge muscle there? And because they can survive in such high densities. And so we didn't, uh, if we did not find Western Ridge muscle, we did not place uh, translocated animals there, but it's certainly a consideration. Oh. Um, do you know, like, if a, if a muscle that is covered with um, Emily might be able to speak better to this, but um, PERSCOM Emily Blevins, uh, she was relaying to me at a different uh, tagging effort, I believe it was floaters, or it was a pearl shell you were working with, they're much more mobile animals than the Western Ridge mussel. So by species, it can vary based on um, uh, how mobile the the animal will be given, you know, some sort of stressor. 
Um, with Western Ridge Muscle being their mobility is low, very low, um, we, we believe that their mortality would be high. Um, other, other muscle species can escape those sorts of stressors. And you can see trails, um, and I've seen presentations by Emily before, where you can see stressed muscles and you know kind of observe their trail where they try to escape that stressor. Um, that's not something we expected from this species. And so I very much would expect that a half a foot of sedimentation would um, be fatal to these muscle beds. Emily, do you have a, do you agree? Yeah, yeah, that great summary. Um, this species really does appear to move very little. And in some cases, we see evidence that the muscle shell has grown to, um, a, you know, bend around a rock or a root where the animal was um, deposited as a juvenile. So um, generally very immobile in these stream habitats as adults. And um, we don't have information on their ability to burrow upwards through um, through sediment, but limited research on um, survival following suction dredge mining has shown that mussels in um, those uh, tailings um, will die. So they're unable to burrow out of um, that deposited sediment that they get trapped in. So that kind of evidence suggests that um, there would be very high mortality in these instances. Um, uh, this is Randy Turner again. Is there any uh, difference in general prosperity of mussels when a system is dominated by cyanobacteria versus, you know, a green algae? Does that, does filtering out cyanobacteria tend to lead to less successful muscle populations? That, that's a really great question. I don't know of any research that has looked specifically at that. Um, in the textbook written about mussels, um, the author wrote that um, despite more than 100 years of research, we know very little about what mussels eat. <laughs> and so um, unfortunately, we're still pretty far behind in understanding um, particular food items, what they're able to process, maybe what might cause more stress to them, but that kind of research is, is underway. Um, but again, mussels do have this incredible filtration, so they may not be eating what they're filtering. They may be um, pr producing biodeposits that um, essentially are kind of mucus wrapped packages that they're spitting back out into the environment. Um, and that often becomes a food source for other species. But um, but there is a lot of evidence that mussels in lake environments are able to really produce um, much, much more oligotrophic-like conditions, um, depending on the density of the species. So um, hopefully we'll know more about um, how cyanobacteria or other algal species affect mussels. But that would be a great research project for a place like um, Upper Klamath Lake. In my opinion, yeah. It's in the room, hint, hint. Yeah. Research work. All right. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any online. Any other questions in the room? Yes. Uh, Travis Owen from the Natural Science Department here at Oregon Tech. Um, first, I ask you, forgive my naivety uh, for this question. You might have kind of already answered it, but could you speak a little bit about? the choice of the distribution of the muscles, the numbers that you left in place versus the numbers you moved. And, and you kind of already answered this, I think, but uh, what was the choice for not moving any upstream from Iron Gate? Yeah, uh, so the choice to not move uh, muscles upstream was really a logistical one. Um, the roads along the river exist, um, but uh, are pretty rough. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, the, the most minimal time out of water. And part of the translocation plan is to indeed take them out of water, put them in coolers on wet towels. But, um, and, you know, based on that SOP I was, I was mentioning, um, we have good data to suggest that uh, they'll fare well with that um, technique, but it was really uh, truly to minimize time out of water. And then, um, uh, as for leaving muscles in place versus moving them, um, it really came down to, uh, there wasn't a lot of, of rhyme and reason to, to that. It was a, a bit of a rush to, to get the labor and supplies in place. And it was a kind of a day by day, you know, I had up, you know, up to 10 volunteer uh, uh, laborers 
down to two per day. So depending on what I felt like we could accomplish in a day, that it was a day by day decision. Um, so I wish I had a better answer for you in that regard, but that was that was how. No, I understand. Yeah. Sometimes uh, out, outside <laughs> variables to <laughs> determine the numbers. And one more, was there a question in the back? Last one. Uh, John, follow Is there any information on population trends in the upper base? Like, I'm really curious about the yeah, they can exist in uh, in lentic environments much more so than the other two. Western ridge mussel do occur in um, BC in lakes, um, but but typically they're in loaded systems. Um, there is data for the upper basin, and Emily had a map uh, earlier about um, where those different um, species are found. Some of that data is pretty old. And um, I've been leading uh, kind of a, a minimal intern uh, resurvey of some of those efforts in the upper basin, some of those uh, sites. So um, in 2020 through 2023, we have uh, new survey data to revisit some of these sites. And so we did the entirety of the Wood River, um, the entirety of the lower Williamson from Collier to the mouth, and now we're segmenting the sprig and working upstream from the Williamson and upward. So um, we are systematically revisiting some of these sites, but yeah, there is a database and and recent um, and updated survey data as to um, the different species and where they are, they, they are existing. Um, we want to get to a break here. This is a good opportunity. Uh, Christy and Emily, thank you so much for a great presentation.